And I'm going to start a local recording now, too. Jesse Symbiosis Miller, right? Sounds good. Hello, Jesse. Hello. Excellent. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Good to be here. Jesse, this is Judy, and I'll be uh, looking at, and Johan is on here too. We'll be looking at the chat transcript as it goes through, and we will be um, reading them out to you at, when you are ready for questions, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Okay, so probably won't interrupt you during the talk, uh -huh. um, but we will, um, we will, uh, when you let us know, we can, Stop I will probably be the main one. What's that? Uh, you started recording. I, Just to let you know, you're live for now. There we go. Sorry, I, we had a feedback going. That was my fault. It should be. All right, let, let everybody in from the um, waiting room, please. And if you guys need to reach me while I'm talking, I just sent, I just emailed you my phone number so you can text me. That might be the best way. Okay, I think we're, we're live. We're, we are here. Shall we get started? So hi, everybody. Wanted to welcome you to our first virtual program meeting for the California Native Plant Society Santa Clara Valley chapter. I'm Vivian New, the chapter president. And tonight we have Jesse Miller with us. He's going to be talking about maintaining California lichen diversity in an era of global change. Um, but before I turn it over to Jesse, I'm going to just give you a little update about some of our chapter activities. We have three things coming up. There will be a meeting for our photography group and that's open to everybody. If you wanna join the group, uh, you can go on our website, cnps-scv.org and there's information about the group there. Uh, but that'll be a photo sharing meeting, a uh, virtual one on Zoom. That's on Wednesday, June 10th at 7 p.m. And then on Saturday, June 13th, we're gonna have the fourth session of our Going Native Garden Tour. And that's where we have garden owners and come in and give us a, a tour of their gardens virtually. And then they answer questions about them. It's a lot of fun and you get to learn about, get to see people's gardens and get to learn a little bit about them. And then you can also ask questions of the owners. And then our next program meeting is going to be on Thursday, June 18th at 7 p.m. And that's on juggling jewel flowers, which is going to be a talk by Justin Whittle. And we are still scheduling more uh, activities. So if you are not currently receiving information about our programs, you can get that by sending a message to cnps-scv-news plus subscribe at Google Groups and you can join our news list. It doesn't get much traffic, but it will give you information about all our upcoming activities. And then uh, we have, our nursery has gone virtual. And so uh, you can order plants online now and we will deliver them to you, assuming you live between Belmont and San Jose. And then just a little bit of logistics. We welcome questions, but there's a lot of people joining us tonight. So we would appreciate any questions being typed into chat. Doesn't matter if you're on YouTube or on Zoom, we have people monitoring both. And then at the end of the presentation, our moderator, Judy Fennerty, will be reading them to their our presenter.
So uh, just so now I'm going to turn it over to Jesse, um, who has spent many years working as a botanist and a lichenologist across California and the Pacific Northwest. He received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin Madison, and there he studied the habitat connectivity on grassland plant communities. He's currently a lecturer at Stanford, and he teaches several ecology classes there, including inquiry-based courses that get undergraduates involved in real-world ecological research. And his research interests include the effects of global change factors, such as altered fire regimes on lichen and plant communities. He loves sharing his passion for the natural world with others, and he really enjoys contributing to Northern California's growing group of lichen enthusiasts. So I will turn it over to you now, Jesse. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Vivian. Well, it's great to be here, uh, here in the virtual world with all of you. And uh, I appreciate CNPS, um, you know, taking a broad definition of plants to uh, include other autotrophs like lichens. Uh, yeah, for, uh, for those of you who are plant people who maybe haven't spent a lot of time looking at lichens or thinking about lichens, uh, I think you will find they're uh, just as intriguing and uh, perhaps uh, not even as hard to identify as uh, members of certain plant families like the Asteraceae. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, plant people and lichen people uh, should come together. And that's what we're doing right now. Uh, so start my slides here. So I'm going to talk tonight about uh, how our concept of what lichens are has changed over time. Uh, and then I'll go on to talk about some research I've been working on recently with uh, undergraduates at Stanford in a class I've been teaching, as Vivian mentioned. And uh, of course, I'll be happy to take any questions and discuss any of this uh, with people at the end. So I want to start out by just talking about uh, what are lichens. Um, it sounds like maybe a fairly simple question, but the definition of lichens has actually changed um, a lot over uh, the last few centuries, but uh, particularly in the last few years, like just even the last five years, we've really learned a lot of new things. So the definition that I was taught when I was in college uh, was that lichens are a symbiotic uh, organism uh, comprised of a fungus and an alga uh, living in symbiosis. Um, and sometimes uh, the photosynthesizing partner can be uh, cyanobacterium instead of an alga. Uh, but the basic definition is, you know, the fungus, the photosynthesizing partner, um, living this intertwined life cycle. And this definition um, is what we've used for a long time, but tonight I'm going to tell you uh, it's not the whole story. And uh, it's actually, the story is actually something that's still unfolding and we're still figuring out what lichens are. Um, and it's a really exciting time to be thinking about lichens because we're living in an age of uh, rapid advances in lichenology. And this has been facilitated in part by technological advances. Uh, with modern molecular techniques, we have the ability to uh, detect organisms that are very small that we can't see with our eyes. And that's actually um, been a real game changer for understanding what's going on for lichens. So I just wanna uh, kind of go through the long-term story of how our concept of what lichens are has changed to start out here. Uh, so going back to the 1700s, I'm sure most people here are familiar with Carl Linnaeus, who uh, pioneered uh, you know, the taxonomical system that's still in use uh, in Western science. And Linnaeus classified lichens as algae, which you know wasn't really uh, he wasn't really picking up the whole story, as we now know, uh, but we have to give him a break because he was also trying to classify like, you know, every organism on earth. So, you know, maybe he wasn't spending a lot of time on uh, lichens. I don't really know how much time Linnaeus devoted to lichens. Um, 
but things, uh, you know, our concept of how they, of what lichens were changed um, as time went on. And by the 1800s, uh, some German lichenologists, including Karl Wallroth, um, were considering lichens to be fungi. And uh, the thing that they were missing at this point was they didn't realize um, that the algae were, uh, they didn't recognize what the algae were. They actually thought, they did, they saw the algae, they had microscopes, but they thought the algae were reproductive parts that they called ganidia. And uh, so, you know, they were a little bit closer because we now know that most of the biomass of lichens is uh, the fungal partner. Uh, but they didn't quite have it all figured out. And it wasn't until uh, a few decades later that Simon Schwendener, uh, another uh, German lichenologist, recognized that lichens are fungi that have entrapped algae um, or have algae living inside them that photosynthesize. So uh, the lichen, the fungal partner in the lichen basically lives off of the uh, sugars that the algae produces. And this idea was met with skepticism in Schwendener's time. Uh, it really wasn't widely accepted for several decades until around the turn of the century, um, around year 1900. That's when scientists really started to accept that lichens were these symbiotic organisms with both a fungal and a photosynthesizing partner. Um, and actually a kind of fun side note is uh, there's, uh, you may hear uh, people talk about, you know, in lichen circles, there's this idea that Beatrix Potter, who's, you know, well known as a children's book author, but was also a, um, uh, you know, fairly uh, skilled natural scientist. Uh, the story is that she was actually an early proponent of the symbiosis theory for lichens. I was doing a little research to prepare for this talk, and unfortunately, I discovered that uh, it, that rumor is apparently not true, so I'm, I'm sorry to relay the bad news to anyone who was um, excited about Beatrix Potter being an early proponent, because I certainly was. Um, but in any case, by around the year 1900, this idea that lichens are symbiotic organisms with fungal and algal partners uh, was becoming more widely accepted. And that definition, you know, that Simon Schwendener developed in the 1860s you know, didn't undergo substantial changes for the next 150 years. So, you know, those of us who are lucky enough to learn about lichens when we were in school probably learned this definition, you know, that it's basically two partners, the fungus and the photosynthesizing partner. And uh, this is a, just a close-up um, electron microscope image of what a lichen is, of a, of a lichen in cross-section. So the white, uh, the whitish grayish uh, strands here are fungal hyphae or strands of fungal tissue. And you can see these things that look like peas are actually the algae. So they're photosynthesizing um, and you can kind of see that the algae are uh, connected to the fungi um, and that's how the fungi get the sugar out of the algae that they use to survive. Uh, and there's been a lot of, even, you know, even though it's been recognized for quite some time that both these partners are involved in lichen symbiosis, uh, the nature of this relationship has been debated and discussed quite a bit. Um, people have sometimes talked about it as a controlled parasitism. Uh, it's sometimes been described as a mutualism. You know, people uh, debate whether, you know, both partners are getting equal benefits or not, which, you know, can kind of get into a philosophical uh, discussion. But in any case, we've recognized for quite some time now that lichens are these symbiotic organisms, whatever the actual nature of their relationship is. And one thing I want to point out, uh, because it becomes important a little bit later in the story, is that almost all the lichens uh, that we see are in the uh, fungal uh, group uh, called the Ascomycetes. And I'm sure this is familiar to many people here, but for anyone who isn't familiar with the uh, different divisions of the fungal kingdom, uh, the Ascomycetes are the group of fungi that include morel mushrooms uh, and also the uh, brewer's yeast, uh, the yeast that are made, that are used to make beer and bread. Um, so these are all fungi that are, you know, that are all around us, even if we're not necessarily aware of them. 
Um, so almost all the lichens in the world are uh, have ascomycetes as the primary fungus that makes up the lichen. Um, and we'll come back to uh, these fungal clades in a little bit. So what ended up developing um, and over time uh, with this concept of lichens as fungi and algae, algae living in partnership was uh, scientists begin to define lichens based on the fungal partner. So when we say the uh, name of a lichen, like Avernia prunastri, uh, the Latin name of a lichen, that actually refers to the name of the fungal partner. And this makes sense because uh, there are not very many algae that make up lichens. Uh, so, you know, if we named lichens after the algae, um, it wouldn't make for very good species concepts, whereas there are a whole lot of different lichen fungi out there. So it's, it's been a reasonable taxonomic system over the years, uh, but there are also um, some reasons why it might not be perfect. Also, lichen reproductive parts, uh, the sexual reproductive parts, are uh, produced by the fungal partner. So they fit nicely into the existing fungal taxonomy, you know, that existed even before we really understood what lichens were. Uh, but I'll give you an example of how this taxonomic system doesn't always work perfectly. Uh, and this example is from uh, a paper by Toby Sverbeel, uh, and it involves Briaria fremontii, or uh, horsehair lichen. And this is a lichen that grows in dry conifer forests. Uh, you'll find it in the Sierra Nevada and California, but also throughout um, forested parts of the Great Basin, like the Northern Great Basin. It's actually an important uh, traditional food that's been eaten by indigenous people too. Um, Briaria fremontii uh, is dark brown in color. And there's another species that has historically been called Briaria tortuosa that's um, oops, that's fairly distinctive from Briaria fremontii. Uh, it's, uh, it, the appearance is different. It's a lighter color. It has more of a chartreuse color. And that chartreuse color is produced by a chemical called vulpinic acid. That's the same chemical in wolf lichen. And there are also some ecological differences between these two lichens. Uh, so for a long time, lichenologists thought of these as two different species. But once we developed molecular sequencing techniques, uh, lichenologists realized that these two species are actually uh, the same fungus and they have the same algal partner as well. Um, but you know, they seem completely different in many ways. So it raises the question of whether the species concept based on the fungal partner is really uh, sufficient. And um, a major discovery in lichenology occurred in 2016 when Toby Sprabeel, a lichenologist from Montana who is now uh, a professor in Alberta, discovered that there can be a third uh, partner in lichen symbiosis. And this partner is a basidiomycete fungus. Um, and this was a uh, a pretty major development because for all these years we've thought of lichens as just being a single fungus and typically a single photosynthesizing partner. Um, so going back to our fungal tree of life here, the basidiomycetes are um, the, the next group uh, related to the ascomycetes. And for anyone who's not familiar, basidiomycetes include all of our gilled mushrooms. So, you know, typically when you think of fungi, you might be thinking of a basidiomycete. So this discovery um, indicated that in lichens that are made up of primarily an ascomycete fungus, there can also be an additional fungal partner from the basidiomycete group. So, you know, two different partners that are totally uh, unrelated, or at least very distantly related, nothing is unrelated, um, that are living in symbiosis along with the photosynthesizing partner. So, uh, and this was, I'm sure some of you heard about this when the news came out in 2016. It actually got a lot of attention in the mainstream press, which was kind of pleasantly surprising because, uh, you know, lichenologists aren't really uh, used to receiving a lot of uh, attention in the press uh, or, you know, uh, mainstream interest. And this was actually like uh, in headlines. It was really interesting, um, which is great. You know, I think what we, in my opinion, Americans uh, care about lichens and, you know, they want more lichens in the news. So if any journalists are out there listening to this, I encourage you to, uh, you know, continue following up on the important cutting edge lichen stories of our day. 
so going back to this, uh, these two, you know, uh, species of lichen, Briorio fremontii and what had been called Briorio tortuosa, uh, Toby discovered that Briorio tortuosa, uh, despite having the same fungus and the same uh, photosynthesizing partner as Briorio fremontii, uh, actually had um, a much greater amount of this third partner, the Basidiomyces yeast. And so in these panels on the right here, um, those little glowing green dots are the Basidiomyces yeast. And you can see there's a lot more of it in the Briorio tortuosa side. So uh, this suggests that not only is this, this third partner present in the symbiosis, but it's also uh, potentially having important effects on the phenotype of these organisms or you know, the appearance, the chemistry, the ecology of these organisms. And uh, the story just continues to uh, get wilder as time goes on. And uh, the next major development in this saga was that uh, the biologist Vera Tovenin uh, in 2018 discovered an example of lichen symbiosis where there were actually four partners that seemed to be intimately involved in a symbiotic relationship. And this time the uh, subject was wolf lichen, which I'm sure is familiar to many people here. It's uh, one of the most distinctive lichens in California. We don't see it much here in the Bay Area, uh, but it's on almost every conifer in the Sierras, um, often becoming really abundant, especially on red fir. It's uh, from a distance, you can tell red firs from other trees by uh, the, little, the amount of wolf lichen and mixed stands sometimes. So anyway, uh, the story is just getting even crazier uh, because this study documented that we have uh, Lotharia or wolf lichen, which is the uh, primary ascomycete partner. And then there are these two basidiomycete fungi that both seem to be playing important roles in, uh, in this symbiotic relationship in addition to the photosynthesizing partner. And uh, Another interesting tidbit about this study was one of the Basidiomyces yeast partners uh, was this Basidiomyces called Tremella. And Tremella had previously been thought of as a potential pathogen, um, or at least a secondary fungus that lived in these lichens, forming these specialized structures called galls. Um, so this little uh, nodule there is what they call galls. Um, but it turned out even when the galls are, aren't present, the tremella can be present um, as yeast cells or single-celled fungi uh, living in the outer surface of these lichens. Uh, and further, it turned out tremella was directly tapping into the algae. Um, previously, it had been thought of as a mycoparasite or a parasite of the primary fungus, but it turns out it's bypassing the primary fungus and it has its own direct relationship with the algae or the photosynthesizing partner. So, you know, really kind of uh, mind-blowing stuff uh, that really changed the paradigm of uh, the way we thought that lichens and these other associated fungi work. And uh, one quote from this paper that I thought really summed this up nicely was, our results suggest that the extent of occurrence and cellular interactions of known fungi within lichens have historically been underestimated and raise new questions about their function in specific lichen symbioses. Uh, and these findings have, uh, have not been unquestioned. There's, uh, there have been recent studies just in the last couple years that have suggested that, you know, these Basidiomyces yeast, the, the, you know, the famed third partner of these lichens may not be as widespread as um, some of the initial studies had suggested. They don't, they certainly don't occur in every lichen species. Um, and they may not be as intimately involved in the symbiosis as the other two partners are. We really have a lot left to learn about what these yeasts are doing. But I think there's no question that, you know, they can be an important component of the symbiosis at least uh, some of the time in some places, in some species. Um, and I think it's still safe to say this is the biggest development in lichenology in the last 150 years. Um, and one uh, paper that was kind of um, 
commentary on the on Vera's paper uh, summed it up in a way that I thought was nice. It said a better approach may be to think about symbiosis as a choir of functions, signal dependent and dynamic in nature, with both both positive and negative functions being undertaken by a range of players at different times as environmental factors vary. Um, and you know, as we're, we're stacking up more species here, we have three species symbiosis, we have four species symbiosis. It's hard to imagine we won't, um, you know, come to see that there are even more players in the game than, than four. Uh, so I think this metaphor of thinking of it as a choir of functions, um, you know, where we may not even have a consistent group of partners that are always present in every lichen is a promising route. And I, I took this as inspiration um, for what I'm going to talk about now, which is some research I've been working on uh, with undergrads at Stanford. And what we've come to learn is that, uh, in fact, there can be dozens or even hundreds of different fungi living inside an individual lichen. Uh, and historically, you know, we've considered many of these fungi to be kind of secondary, um, you know, maybe opportunistic pathogens, uh, things that aren't really deeply involved in the symbiosis or the, the symbiotic relationship. Um, but now we're starting to question, you know, what is the function of all these different fungi living inside lichens? Uh, what are they all doing? And does their composition change in different ecological settings? So I want to talk a little bit about some research I've been working on uh, to address that. But before I get to my research, I just want to briefly talk about uh, why we should care about lichens in an ecological sense. Um, since, you know, for those of you who aren't very familiar with lichens, this may seem like kind of an obscure uh, topic to be delving so deeply into. So one reason why I really care about lichens is because they're a major component of biodiversity in almost all terrestrial ecosystems. Um, one cool thing about the symbiotic relationship is it uh, allows the, the fungi and the photosynthesizing partners to live in environments where uh, perhaps neither would be able to live individually. So, you know, we have diverse lichen communities in some of the driest deserts on Earth, um, but also in some of the wettest rainforests on Earth. And we have a little joke in uh, e ecological presentations that there always has to be a slide um, that represents biodiversity and typically it's a collage of some sort. So this is my collage uh, representing biodiversity for this evening. Uh, and but besides being a major component of terrestrial biodiversity, uh, lichens are very beautiful too. And you know, in my mind, that's uh, also important. But lichens also play some important ecological roles. And uh, you know, if you have trouble getting people to care about uh, small, kind of uh, cryptic organisms. Uh, all you have to do is tell people that animals eat them and then people care a lot more. That's what I've learned. So lichens actually provide forage and nesting material for a lot of different animals. And one of my favorite examples of this is Bryoria, the lichen we were just talking about, horsehair lichen, uh, is actually a uh, pretty important food for flying squirrels in the uh, forest, the conifer forests of Northern California and the Pacific Northwest. And the flying squirrel is in turn a uh, very important food for the spotted owl, which is one of our most iconic uh, animal species of conservation concern. I'm sure many people here know the uh, you know, long saga of the spotted owl leading to major uh, legislative changes that protected a lot of rare organisms uh, in Northern California and the Pacific Northwest. So if we lost the, uh, the horsehair lichen from this ecosystem, it could potentially be really detrimental to the spotted owl. But there are lots of other uh, animals that depend on lichens too. Another great example is caribou or reindeer in boreal and Arctic ecosystems. Uh, caribou uh, lichen is um, the makes up most of their diet, and they actually migrate long distances to find the good lichens. So you know, I've been known to migrate some distances to find lichens too. So I feel like I can relate to the caribou uh, in some ways. So anyway, I hope I've convinced you that, you know, in addition to being beautiful and fascinating, the lichens are also, uh, you know, even if you don't care about that, you should care about them because animals eat them. And what's more important than animals, right? Um, so uh, another uh, thing that I'd like to point out about lichens uh, that makes them useful to people is they're really sensitive environmental indicators. 
And lichens have been used as indicators of uh, many different ecological phenomena. I'm actually going to talk in a couple of weeks for the Yerba Buena chapter about some research I've been doing using lichens as indicators of old growth forests. Um, and also using lichens as indicators of fire history for different sites. Uh, but perhaps most famously, lichens have been used as indicators of air pollution. Um, typically, uh, lichens that have a lot of surface area, like the fruticose or hair-like lichens pictured on the left here, only occur in places with relatively uh, clean air or high air quality. And uh, as you move along the gradient towards uh, places with more air pollution, you typically get uh, smaller lichens with less surface area. And often you actually get um, a great abundance of yellow and orange lichens in places with uh, high air pollution. And uh, these lichens are nitrophiles or lichens that do well in environments with highly enriched nitrogen. Uh, and that photo on the right is from the Stanford campus, which um, has, you know, relatively elevated levels of nitrogen, uh, partly just from being in kind of an urban area, but uh, uh, car traffic, um, uh, car exhaust contains a lot of uh, nitrogen chemicals that lead to these kinds of orange and yellow lichen blooms. And uh, this, this nitrogen enrichment um, that's caused by cars, but also by industrial activities and agriculture, actually has a lot of um, potentially detrimental ecological effects, as I'm sure many people here know. Um, in addition to affecting lichens, it's been linked to uh, forest pests. Um, there's a lot of research showing that invasive species can benefit from nitrogen deposition. Uh, here in California, a lot of our annual grasses uh, actually, uh, the exotic European annual grasses actually benefit from nitrogen deposition. Uh, it can alter fire cycles, uh, lead to eutrophication of lakes and algal growth, and even change uh, mycorrhizal communities. And uh, lichens can actually be great for monitoring uh, air quality um, and nitrogen in particular, because we can analyze the tissue of, of lichens and uh, see what pollutions are present in, what pollutants are present in the area, because lichens are basically just soaking up everything that's in the air around them. Uh, unlike plants, lichens don't have roots. Uh, so they actually are much more sensitive to what's in the air around them than uh, vascular plants are. So uh, with all of this background in mind, I set out, when I started working at Stanford a couple years ago, I set out to design an undergraduate class uh, that would teach basic ecological research skills. Um, and I had a lot of freedom to determine how to do this. Uh, and I sought to explore this idea of symbiosis as a choir of different singers with different functions. But I also wanted to integrate the idea of global change into this class. We're living in an era where humans have uh, caused, you know, really substantial manipulations to the ecosystems around us. And I think, uh, you know, training students in, e in ecology today, it's really important to integrate this idea of global change uh, because it's really hard to be an ecologist today without uh, thinking about and studying global change. Um, so I uh, developed this course uh, using lichens as a study system. Um, uh, the course was called Introduction to Research in Ecology and Evolution. And uh, the idea is that we teach students ecology um, through the process of conducting real world ecological research, um, which I think is a really wonderful opportunity. Um, there's actually been uh, scientific studies showing that this uh, inquiry based approach where students learn through the process of doing ecological research um, can actually be a better learning experience than more of what we might call a cookbook style course, um, you know, where they're doing experiments with predetermined results. Uh, here, we're actually, you know, putting them out in the real world and having them ask questions where we don't know what the answers are going to be. So in this course, I wanted to balance asking some uh, basic fundamental biology uh, questions with uh, some more applied questions um, you know, with real world uh, relevance outside of uh, kind of cryptic uh, scientific concepts. So the applied question we asked was, what are the spatial patterns of air pollution around the Stanford campus? Um, and specifically, do small green spaces on campus provide cleaner air? Um, 
But then on more of the basic uh, ecology, basic biology side, we were also curious if the communities of fungi living inside lichens varied in response to environmental conditions uh, and air pollution. So to address these questions, we went out and we sampled um, a number of study sites uh, in the vicinity of the Stanford campus. So uh, in this figure, this is the main Stanford campus up here. Um, so we had a number of study sites, uh, mostly along Junipero Serra uh, between main campus and the dish. Um, and then we had some study sites at the Stanford dish, uh, mostly kind of in the vicinity of Old Page Mill Road. And uh, then we had a few sites in residential neighborhoods up in the foothills south of I-280. And we also had a number of study sites at the Jasper Ridge uh, Preserve, which is Stanford's biological research preserve. Um, and in this map, the points are color coded by annual precipitation. So you can see that the sites in the foothills get quite a bit more rain uh, than the sites down on campus. And uh, in this study, we focused on a lichen called Avernia prunastri, uh, or oak moss lichen. And uh, this lichen was a good study system because it's pretty widespread. It's uh, something of a generalist. And um, we were able to find it across a gradient of precipitation and air pollution. Uh, one thing that we keyed into and were especially interested in was that Avernia is sometimes infected by another fungus. Um, called Unguiculariopsis. Uh, my students quickly nicknamed it Young Larry instead of Unguiculariopsis. Uh, and we were curious about what Young Larry is doing and why it only infects some of our neolichens, but not all of them. Uh, and Young Larry was especially interesting to us because you can't see most of the fungi living inside lichens. They're mostly microscopic, but young Larry makes these distinctive uh, black structures called ascomata, which are reproductive structures. So at a glance, you can tell whether an Avernia lichen is infected with young Larry or not. Um, so in addition to just uh, examining whether young Larry was present, we also collected lichens for DNA sequencing to try to assess the whole community of fungi uh, that are present inside these lichens. Uh, so, uh, we had a lot of fun going out and uh, collecting lichens. Uh, we got to bike to some of our study sites that were close to campus, uh, which was nice. We took the bus over to Jasper Ridge, which is just a few miles away. Um, the students extracted the DNA from the lichens in lab. And uh, we also prepared lichen tissue samples to analyze air pollutants. Um, and we took these samples to Stanford's uh, inductively coupled plasma mass spec facility, um, which is a super high tech uh, facility that was able to analyze our lichen tissue and see uh, what pollutants were present as a way of quantifying air pollution at our study sites. Um, and we we're lucky to collaborate with Carrie Weaver, who's uh, a scientist there who uh, was able to help us get our samples processed. So I'll show you some of the results of our study. Um, and this map is showing uh, nitrogen levels in the lichens we sampled on the Stanford campus. And so in this image, in this map, the uh, brighter, the more yellow and orange colors represent higher nitrogen levels. And the uh, darker purple and blackish colors represent lower nitrogen levels. So you can see, um, not surprisingly, nitrogen levels were higher in the more urbanized area of the main campus. Um, but also at the Stanford Dish, we saw very high nitrogen levels. And this may be because uh, Page Mill Road is a very high traffic road that passes by these study sites. And also I-280 is right here. Um, the wind is blowing. Um, kind of east to west and probably depositing a bunch of the nitrogen from I-280 uh, into these study sites. So um, we usually think of 1% as being a threshold of nitrogen content in lichens, above which um, uh, values above one represent uh, anthropogenic nitrogen deposition. Um, and so we had values as high as 2% nitrogen composition, which actually means uh, a highly enriched nitrogen environment, much more nitrogen than you would find uh, in a natural environment. 
Uh, in comparison, nitrogen levels were relatively low at Jasper Ridge. This, in many of our study sites, they were still uh, somewhat enriched. They were higher than we would expect the historical baseline to be. Um, but when you get back into some of the more secluded little valleys at Jasper Ridge, uh, the nitrogen levels were actually quite low, like perhaps almost in line with what we might expect uh, was present historically. We also looked at the um, levels of several heavy metals in our uh, lichen samples. And I'm only going to show this one, although we analyzed several, several heavy metals. Uh, this is a map of the amount of lead in our, our lichen samples. Um, so you can see kind of the, a similar pattern to nitrogen. Lead levels are relatively low at Jasper Ridge and in the southern foothills. Uh, but we see uh, substantially elevated levels of lead at our study sites um, in, in the more developed areas uh, closer to campus. And this uh, scale is, once again, uh, orange and yellow represent higher levels. And this is actually a log scale. So what this means is we saw um, over a tenfold increase in lead levels uh, between our lowest sites and our highest sites. And I don't, uh, I haven't fully looked into interpreting this in a health context. I don't know, um, you know how recently this lead uh, has been deposited there, uh, but there's a lot of potential for using this data to ask more health-related questions, I think. Um, and one thing I want to point out is, you know, we were able to do this work very cheaply. Uh, to do this kind of uh, high-resolution air quality monitoring using machines uh, would cost uh, probably tens of thousands, if not $100,000. Um, so lichens are really an amazing tool for being able to make these uh, high resolution maps of air quality. And one lesson uh, that I think came out of this was we found that urban green spaces uh, do appear to provide substantial refuges, um, refuge from air pollution. And one example was this little park called Frenchman Park, uh, which is uh, right next to the Stanford campus. It's, um, you know, not much bigger. Well, it's a little bit bigger than what you're seeing in this photo, but it's a small park. And we found that our study site uh, in this park, which was about 50 meters, maybe a little more from Junipero Serra, um, a major street, had much lower uh, levels of the air pollutants we looked at uh, than our study sites that were represented right along Junipero Serra. Um, and I thought this was really cool. I've always been a big fan of urban green spaces. And I think this uh, speaks to their value. Um, it does appear that they can have, you know, significantly lower air pollution, uh, even if they're not huge. Um, and, you know, potentially contribute to biodiversity as a result of that. Uh, another thing we found was that the main lichen we were focusing on, which is Avernia or oak moss lichen, uh, becomes a lot less abundant as you go down the hill uh, into the developed area around campus. Um, so up here in the foothills, it's wetter, it's less polluted, and Avernia seems really happy. It's still present down here on campus, but there's just not nearly as much of it. Uh, so here the purple color, the darker uh, purple and black colors represent low abundance, the orange represents high abundance. Um, and uh, one reason why I mentioned this is because it turned out that the abundance of Avernia um, seemed to be the strongest predictor of this secondary fungus that infects Avernia, or perhaps lives in symbiosis with Avernia. So uh, this fungus that we called Young Larry uh, became abundant at uh, sites, oh, and sorry, this x-axis should say Avernia abundance, not nitrogen content, I messed that up. Um, at sites where Avernia was, oops, uh, was really abundant, uh, we tended to see a lot of this other fungus living uh, with Avernia or infecting Avernia, but at sites where Avernia was not very abundant, it was rarely present. So what seemed to be going on was uh, air pollution and precipitation seemed to influence Avernia abundance, and then uh, that in turn seems to be the primary determinant of uh, where this secondary fungus that infects Avernia occurs, which was kind of interesting because initially I'd expected that uh, this that young Larry might be affected uh, directly by these environmental variables. And uh, so one more result I'll talk about is the uh, DNA sequencing that we did uh, to look at what uh, fungi were living inside these Avernia besides young Larry. And 
uh, the results were very surprising. When I got the results back from the lab, it turned out that corn or ZMAs made up 37% uh, of the microbiome of these lichens, which, you know, you really wouldn't think corn would be in there. Uh, Nic Nicotiana tenuata um, or tobacco made up 6% of the microbiome. Really, uh, you know, not, not what you would think is going on. It turned out, uh, after I looked at this for a few seconds, I decided something was wrong. It turned out that the lab got our samples mixed up. Uh, so I, I have to tell you, uh, there was no major discovery. There's no corn or tobacco in lichen microbiomes. But for about 10 seconds, it appeared that that was uh, what was going on. So it turned out uh, there are actually a number of different fungi living inside the Avernia samples we collected. Um, uh, in most of our samples, we got somewhere between 10 and 40 different fungi species that were present in substantial quantities. And we don't really know what all these fungi are doing, um, but we were able to document how their composition changes between our different study sites. And so I'm going to show you an ordination diagram of the different fungi that were present in our lichen samples uh, across our study sites. And so in this diagram, um, there'll be a bunch of points uh, in this box when I put them up here. And when uh, two points are close together, that means that the uh, samples had more similar fungal communities. And when two points are far apart, that means that uh, these two samples had more different fungal communities. Um, which, and so, yeah, that's basically all you have to worry about to interpret this diagram. So this is the whole diagram with all of our study sites on it. So here are sites from Jasper Ridge are coded in blue. And our sites from the Stanford Dish are coded in black. And then the sites that were kind of in the middle are coded in yellow and orange. Um, so one thing that I want to point out is just that uh, there's a lot of variety in the communities of fungi living inside the lichens uh, that we found at Jasper Ridge, which is kind of cool. It's a biological preserve. You know, it's known as um, a spot with substantial biodiversity. But I think it's kind of cool to document that there's just this much biodiversity happening at a very, uh, you know, microscopic scale as well. And then another thing I want to point out from this diagram uh, is if we put circles around the uh, sites that we did on the main campus or the samples from the main campus um, and the sites that we did at Jasper Ridge, you can see that uh, there's not a whole lot of overlap. You know, for the most part, we seem to be uh, detecting relatively different communities of fungi living inside these lichens between Jasper Ridge and campus. And, um, you know, this is the gradient between the, the wetter, uh, less polluted sites at Jasper Ridge and the drier, uh, more polluted sites on the main campus. Um, so it appears that these environmental variables uh, may be having a significant effect on what fungi are actually present inside the lichens, um, which I think is a really interesting result, even though it perhaps, you know, raises more questions than it answers about what's really going on here. So I'm, uh, I'm getting towards the end here. Uh, and so I'll uh, wrap up with a few conclusions. Um, I think one interesting thing that came from this study is uh, it seems like air pollution may have cryptic effects on biodiversity. We, uh, you know, we know that pollution can affect biodiversity in ways that we can see, um, you know, benefiting annual grasses and stuff like that. But it may actually be affecting these microscopic communities of fungi living inside lichens, which is really pretty fascinating in my mind. Um, another cool little. Uh, uh, piece that came out of this story was it does appear that urban green spaces may provide substantial respite from air pollution, um, which I just thought was really neat because I really wasn't sure there would be that much benefit to these little parks, even though I, I hoped there would be. Um, and I think this metaphor of thinking of the different partners in, sim in lichen symbiosis as a choir of many singers uh, seems to be apt based on the research we did. Um, our, our studies suggest that the fungal communities in lichens uh, are diverse and they may respond to multiple uh, environmental gradients, to gradients of anthropogenic influence, uh, but certainly their full story remains to be explored. And this is really just a preliminary analysis. Uh, there's a lot more to learn about what's going on in these lichens. And it's a really interesting time to be talking about air pollution because as I think everyone in the Bay Area knows and beyond, 
uh, you know, air pollution has really decreased because uh, fewer people are driving uh, due to COVID right now. And uh, so I'm very curious, you know, what the effects of this will be on our lichens. Uh, I'm, you know, it's unclear whether we'll have another normal school year next year or not. But if we're able to hold classes, I hope to go back to some of these study sites and, uh, you know, see if the air pollution levels have changed and if we can actually detect a decrease in air pollution, uh, because there's certainly a lot less traffic on Page Mill Road right now. Uh, than there has been historically. Um, and, you know, if we want to dream really big, uh, does this mean that lichens might be expanding their ranges, uh, you know, while air pollution is reduced during COVID? I mean, that may be a little bit too much to hope for, but personally, I would like to imagine that when I return to Stanford, whenever it reopens, um, all the buildings are going to be coated with uh, beautiful lichens, and uh, lichens will just be draping from all the trees. And uh, you know we'll have to scrape the lichens off to open the doors and windows when we get back. We'll we'll see. You know that might be a little too much to ask for, but that's personally uh, the vision that I'm uh, imagining for the future. And this is an artistic representation of what what Stanford might look like. Uh, you know if it reopens after this uh, period of low air pollution. Yeah. Um, Anyway, it was hard to pare down everything I want to say about lichens into this, uh, you know, relatively short talk. Uh, so for anyone who's interested, I just want to mention I'm going to give another talk uh, in just about two weeks uh, for the Yerba Buena chapter of CNPS. It'll also be online, of course, like everything these days. Um, and if you're curious about the bigger picture of how lichen species diversity changes across landscapes, uh, I'll be focusing on uh, how lichens can be indicators for old growth forests and also indicators of altered fire regimes and how lichens respond to fire history. So, uh, you know, I won't be talking as much about the microscopic things going on within lichens, but some of the more big picture landscape level stuff. So I hope you'll join me for that if you uh, haven't had enough of lichens already. Um, and with that, I'll just wrap it up. And I just want to say thanks to everyone who helped make this research possible. This was really a team effort. Um, it's actually kind of amazing to me how many people contributed to this effort. Um, I want to say, uh, well, thanks to all the students. You know, they actually did a lot of this work. Um, but I want to say special thanks to Jess Coyle, who is now a professor at uh, St. Mary's College. Um, but she actually designed uh, an earlier version of this course, and she was the one who pioneered uh, the Young Larry uh, and Avernia study system, which obviously, you know, I've continued to really benefit from. Uh, anyway, also had some great TAs, lab staff, and uh, collaborators at Stanford who contributed a lot to this study. Um, so thanks to everyone. Uh, couldn't have done it without all these people who contributed. Um, and with that, uh, I'll wrap it up. I'd be happy to take any questions. And uh, I also put my contact info up here. I'd love to hear from anyone who uh, you know is interested in lichens. And uh, I lead lichen walks uh, and workshops in the Bay Area periodically when there aren't pandemics going on. So if you'd like to be added to my mailing list for these kinds of events, feel free to drop me a line. And I'd be happy to let you know when this stuff is going on. Uh, you know, hopefully sometime in the not too distant future, we'll all be able to go out and look at some beautiful lichens in the Bay Area again. Uh, so with that, thanks to everyone for coming. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jesse. We have a lot of questions, actually, and some debates going on, it looks <laughs> all like. All right. So, that, I, that's like the best outcome I could hope for. Yeah. So um, first question is, can you define what an autotrope is? Yeah, an autotroph is something that uh, lives under its own power. So, uh, you know, basically we think of anything that can photosynthesize as an autotroph. So plants and lichens. Uh, the rest of, you know, we, like humans are heterotrophs. So we have to eat stuff to survive. And the rest of the fungal kingdom, well, that's not entirely true. Mycorrhizal fungi and lichens um, could, well, yeah, it, we get into philosophical issues, but uh, I'll just leave it there. Okay. Okay, we have two questions on Tremella. Does the lichen look slash behave the same? If you take out the Tremella, I'm sorry, if you take out the Tremella, does the lichen look slash behave the same? Why not think of the Tremella as a kleptoparasite? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. You know, I really, I don't have a good answer for that, either for Tremella or for, I mean, okay, what I'll talk about is uh, Young Larry, which is the kind of analogous uh, fungus that I know more about. 
we kind of came, you know, uh, and this is something that both Jess Coyle and I have worked on. Um, we came into this study imagining that young Larry, uh, like Tremella, might be a parasite that, you know, decreases the fitness of lichens. We generally think that uh, parasites decrease the fitness of their hosts because they're taking something from them. But we've done a bunch of experiments. We've tried to grow infected lichens and uninfected lichens in a growth chamber, and we can't find any evidence that it has any negative effect. Um, so, yeah, we don't, we don't fully understand what's going on, but it may not be as simple as just the classic parasitic relationship. Perhaps the lichen is deriving some kind of benefit from it that balances out uh, whatever the costs are. Um, but yeah, we, there's just, we just don't fully know. But that's a really good question, and I hope uh, maybe I'll have a better answer for you in a couple of years. A uh, follow-up question on the tremella is the, how is it determined that tremella is functionally connected to the algae? Is it morphological or is or is there biochemical evidence? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I'd have to look back at the study to know. That's that's kind of outside of my realm of expertise. Um, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't know how to find that out personally. Um, so yeah, if the person wants to email me, I can go back and look at the study and let you know. That's from Oliver. Um, uh, another question, does the Bryoria fermentii have volcanic acid or is it just the tortuosa with a Basidiomycete. Does that yeah, make sense? It's, it, yeah, it's just the tortuosa that has vulpinic acid. Yeah, Fremontii is actually unique, um, or rel it's relatively unusual among lichens in having no secondary metabolites. Um, so it's a really obvious difference between these two lichens, whereas, you know, the vulpinic acid is very abundant in tortuosa. I think this is more of a, a comment is, uh, we have, I tend to think of these things like our own gut flora, important, yes, but we are still human after a harsh dose of antibiotics and think about the Bryoria. The amount does seem to make the difference in color, not a change in Basidio, sorry, my CT species. Also, there are common intermediates between the two Bryoria. Yeah, yeah, fair point. So, but then again, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, alternative argument would be, if someone revving a car on my street, I might have to go inside if this uh, continues. Um, another argument might be that, you know, species, the con species concepts can be relatively weak too. I mean, life is a continuum and, you know, species can be somewhat of an artificial construct. You know, all 500 species of willows can uh, interbreed. So uh, yeah, I, I agree with the ba with that basic point, but uh, I, you know, I think that could be said of like almost any, or for, for a substantial number of species too. Um, then we had a question, which lichens have been found to have the dozens and, and the hundreds of fungi present? What is the most fungal partners found in one lichen and what genus and species was this? Yeah, so there are, you know, at least a handful of studies that have done this kind of fungal sequencing in lichens. And if someone emails me, I'd be happy to send them some of them. But I can say that dozens to hundreds of species uh, can be present just based on the, the work we did in this class where we sequenced Divernia prunastri. Uh, yeah, we, so I, I, we were conservative. So I said 10 to 40 species of fungi. That's a conservative estimate because um, we actually get, a, we detect a lot more fungi than that in most of our samples, but we drop the ones that are present in low abundance for analysis because um, we're not totally confident in them. But if we just went with the raw data, uh, we very commonly had over a hundred species of fungi detected in our samples. So it's, it's not just a rare outlier. It's, uh, you know, I think that's very common. Like almost any lichen you sequence, you're gonna find um, at least potentially dozens of fungi present. But one thing I would say about that question is I wouldn't necessarily use the word partner for all of them um, because some of these may just be kind of opportunistic secondary fungi. We don't know, you know, we would guess that maybe they're not all intimately related to the actual symbiotic partnership. Then we had a, thank you. Then we had a little chat about how do I encourage lichens in my garden and in my community gardens? And there were some responses saying, just use natural materials that can be around for a long time. Rock, wood posts, and lots of patients. People claim blending lichens with buttermilk and spraying them on works. Buttermilk probably both help them to stick initially and may give some nutrients. So that was a, a question and a response that was in the chat. 
Yeah, that's that's legit. The uh, the buttermilk technique, um, you know, that's that's pretty well known that that can work. Um, there, I've actually uh, known lichenologists who tried to restore uh, lichens in old growth forests by blending up lichens with buttermilk and putting them in water balloons and then using a slingshot to slingshot the water balloons of buttermilk lichens up into the forest canopy. Um, but yeah, other than that, I'd say, I mean, yeah, lichens can be kind of slow growing, but you can try to transplant lichens uh, into your garden. Um, so I live here in kind of the center of San Francisco. Uh, there's So I'm sure many people here know lace lichen, which is our state lichen, very uh, charismatic. Uh, it's actually in the background of this photo that's up on the screen too. Uh, I, so there's no lace lichen in my neighborhood, but it grows like a mile away in Golden Gate Park. So I transplanted some lace lichen into my yard here and uh, it's been growing for over a year and it seems fine. So, uh, you know, if you really want to get adventurous, I encourage you to try to transplant some lichens. Um, we had one suggestion that use a different photo for your pollution um, pollution slide because you had a Tesla in that picture and it doesn't it doesn't pollute so uh. <laughs> all right fair enough I mean kind of kind of appropriate but all right um, are you familiar with work on lichens in Novo Novo Sibirsk Siberia no okay that's a question for later. Um, let's see. Go and get there. Um, oh, and the, the okay. ATM howl is starting, so uh, there may oh, be a background oh dear. Here. Um, so approximately how how fast and how many centimeters per year do these lichen grow? I guess inspired by your picture of Stanford. The, yeah, thank you. That was uh, that was dreaming big, certainly. <laughs> Um, not that fast. I think I've heard of lace lichen growing like half a centimeter in a year, but I wouldn't be surprised if they grow, uh, you know, in some cases they grow more than that, but they can grow very, very slowly too. Uh, Avernia, the lichen I was talking about in my study is actually really cool because it branches annually. So you can estimate the age of a lichen. So an Avernia that's like, you know, uh, four inches long might be maybe eight years old. So it's, you know, for a lichen, it's growing relatively rapidly. A follow up on that, because lichens grow outward, can temporal variation in solution, for example, be detected by subsampling different parts of an old lichen? Hey, yeah, this was that... great, Jesse. What an informative talk. What, what was the last part there? Oh, they were just thanking you for the talk. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, I, I thank them for attending. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question about the subsampling and whether an older part of the lichen might have more pollutants in it. Um, that's, yeah, that's something I would like to look into. I don't know the answer, um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And one could imagine that that could certainly be the case. Okay, we had a question. Uh, what kind of relationship is mostly agreed upon with lichens? I have heard of parasitic and mutualistic from many sources, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm glad. I'm, I appreciate that question. Um, you know, I think the thing, I, I, I see it as primarily a mutualism. And the reason for that is it lets both partners live in places where they couldn't live otherwise. And it's just hard to see how that's not a mutualism. I mean, free living algae you know, it may be a lot, normally we, you know, you, you think about where you actually see algae, like where uh, the side of a building is, has that greenish hue or something, or a rock or a tree or whatever. It's usually in wet, relatively wet, humid places. There may be algae out there that's harder to see, but, you know, there's probably not so much free living algae just in deserts and such, but there are a lot of lichens there. So uh, I think, you know, even though the algae is having to give up its sugars, it still lets it live in places where it couldn't otherwise live. And the lichen fungi can't really do anything without the algae. I mean, they just don't, they don't develop into any kind of like even visible structures without the algae. So yeah, I, I think it's a mutualism personally. Great. Are there lichens that are morphologically and ecologically identical, but with different primary ascomycete mycobionts? Sorry. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Ask my CT mycobionts. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, actually, I'm, I just thought of one example, and that is uh, Alectoria sarmentosa. Um, so this is, for anyone who doesn't know this, it's something you get more up north in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, like it becomes really abundant in the mountains at mid elevations in like the Cascades in Oregon and Washington. And it has uh, what's called a chemotype. Um, it's, it's actually considered a different species. It's called Alectoria vancouverensis, but there are chemical differences between these two species. Uh, they're morphologically, oh wait, but the question, yeah, no, I got it wrong. So yeah, there are species that are I, morphologically identical, but only differ in chemistry. But I think they are actually two different fungi. Although I'm curious if that's actually been confirmed since uh, these sequencing te techniques were developed, because one could imagine that it's the same fungus with dif just different uh, Basidiomyces yeast. But yeah, I can't think of any examples where it's actually the same exact fungus. Um, oh no, no, I did answer that question right. Yeah, okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, stop while you're ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We had a question to recommend reading materials, and then we had a reply that McCoon's Lichens of the Pacific Northwest is a great guide with good keys, although it's missing some species from our area. So did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I agree that, you know, as keys go, um, that's like our best key for our region, if you're in the Bay Area or farther north at least. But there's also a picture book uh, by Stephen Sharnoff called Lichens of California or something like that. And it doesn't have any keys in it, but it's a great reference, um, really nice photos. So I recommend getting both those books and kind of cross-referencing uh, between them. We also had a comment. One, one more reading recommendation. Uh, I think Trevor Goward's essay series, um, I think it's called The Ways of Enlightenment. It's really, it really makes you think about what lichens are and it really addresses a lot of these fundamental questions um, you know, in this era where our, our understanding of lichens is changing. So for people who want some reading to get inspired, I recommend reading Trevor Goward's essays. Great, um, the question is that, is Tortuosa a subspecies of Fremontii now, now or has it been taken out of the taxonomical tree? It's been taken out, yeah. We're supposed to call it Briaria Fremontii now, which, you know, it's like, uh, for, for those of us who have actually like observed these two lichens in the field, it just seems ridiculous to uh, give them the same name. And that brings up a bigger issue, which is really, uh, in an ideal world, we'd have a, a taxonomic system that accounts for multiple partners in these symbiotic relationships, but no one's quite figured out a good way to do that yet, so that's why we don't have it. And we're still stuck with this system we've been using since 1950 based on the primary fungal partner. Um, we have some other comments about books. Um, I think that's it. Is any, am I missing anything to my co-host here? Madeline? Madeline? Okay, um, there was a question early on about the magnification what was the magnification on that electron microscope um, picture, you know, imaging of a um, lichen? Yeah, so I believe that's a folios lichen. So, uh, you know, I don't know the exact like numbers, but I'd say just go, uh, you know, go look at a tree branch and look at how thick, you know, your typical folios lichen is probably under a millimeter thick. So uh, it's a lot of magnification, but, you can, if you cut that lichen, um, if you make a cross section of a lichen and put it under a dissecting scope at low magnification, you can see the algal layer in there. So it's not, you know, it's not blown up uh, like as much as we'd blow up like bacteria or something like that. Okay. Yeah. And I saw Judy. Thank you. Okay, um, so okay, so we had Sharnoffs and then Brodos was mentioned also in the Pacific and McCoons. Is there any other books that you could you re repeat those books, please? Yeah, so uh, Macro Lichens of the Pacific Northwest by McCune. Uh, it, the, the one by Stephen Sharnoff is called California Lichens or Lichens of California, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Trevor Goward's essay series called Ways of Enlightenment, which is all online. You can find it on his website. 
Uh, and then there's one more book called Lichens by uh, sub, by Purvis. I can't remember his first name, but it's like a kind of short, um, easy to read book that just introduces you to all the basic concepts of lichenology too. Okay, great. I think that's everything that I can see. So if anybody has anything else, jump on one of the chats and let us know. But otherwise, um, we'll be posting the YouTube video at some point after the talk. Uh, we have many thank yous coming in on the chat line. Um, and uh, we look forward to your talk. It's in two weeks, you said, in, at your Buena chapter? Yeah, it's on Thursday, so a week from yesterday. Okay, great. I well, really appreciate you coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was really fun. <laughs> I really uh, appreciate you you inviting a lichen person. Yes, yes. One of our, from our chapter too. So you're in Stanford working at Stanford at least during the day. So um, we look forward to maybe we can have you when things clear up and we can have field trips again. We hope to invite you out for that. Yeah, I would love to do that. It's yeah, it's kind of hard not being able to, uh, you know, naturalize with groups of people right now. Yes, yes. Okay, um, if there's nothing else, uh, Vivian, did you have anything else? Just to say thanks to Jesse, that was great. Good, glad you enjoyed it. Well, thank you very much. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Great holiday weekend. Yeah, right. thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.